I want to take a little bit more formal approach than I did last time. So um, suppose we have a profile here. Profile, um, by the way, I, I think I used that term last time, but we have a multiple alignment of sequences. And we have then the, uh, the frequencies of the different residues in each position. And if I have a new sequence here, and just the simplest case, there, there are no uh, spaces, no gaps in this alignment, then we can align easily the new sequence to the profile. Every element in the new sequence uh, is, is aligned with a particular column. And we give a score of uh, SXJ if we have residue X in position J in the sequence. So this is the uh, score for residue X in position J. That's the score that's given um, for, the, for the residues of the characters in the new sequence. And then to see how well the sequence aligned to the profile, then we're just obviously taking the summation, um, j equals 1 through n, where there are n uh, positions in the sequence. So all I'm, all I'm saying is we're going to give a particular score, a particular number, depending on what residue is here in each one of the particular positions. And what I want to talk about today, we talked about informally before, but I want to make a little bit more formal, is where these S's should come from. Okay. From where? <laughs> What numbers are the, are the right numbers to use uh, for, these, for these S's that you're going to use in your score? Because ultimately what you want to do is when you take this sum of this is a big number, you want to say, oh, yes, I believe that this new sequence is very similar, uh, could have been generated in the same way that the sequences in the profile were generated. And if it's a low number, then you want to uh, dismiss that possibility. So usually... SXJ is equal to uh, log, and for certain reasons we often take log base 2. PXJ divided by PX. So this is the probability that residue X is in position J of the profile. Okay? That's, that's collected from this data, from this particular alignment. And we're calling it a probability even though all you're seeing here is a, uh, a sample of all the sequences that, that could be in this family. But at any rate... Uh, last time I called it a frequency or a fraction, whatever. And this P is just the overall probability, overall probability of uh, seeing residue X. That's taken over the entire set of sequences no matter where X is found. Or you could take that as some... Um, uh, other frequency that's, that's collected even over a larger set of sequences. Okay. But uh, the, the key thing is that we've taken the ratio here, and then we've taken the log of that. And last time we discussed a little bit about why you take the ratio and why you take the log. Um, when we looked at this thing as a product later, and we'll get to that again, but, I, but now we're taking sort of a different view where we're looking at each individual position and saying its score, the score that it's going to contribute when there's a residue X in the new sequence at position J is of this form. 
And this is very, very common that scoring matrices or position-specific scoring matrices are formed with this philosophy. When, we, when you actually talk about PAM matrices and Blossom matrices that are substitution matrices, that they're used in a slightly different context, we'll see that the same idea comes up again, that we're going to be taking the ratio of something observed to something that could be predicted if things were totally random, and then taking the log of that. So I wanted to, again, just give you some um, motivation for why that's a reasonable thing to do. Okay, so why, why a ratio, and then later why take logs? Okay, so the ratio, I'm just going to try to motivate that by two extremes. Okay, um, one is that PXJ is large. Um, well, the, the, the two extremes uh, both, well, one is that PXJ is large, okay? But the two ways, uh, two subcases to this, one is that PX is large, and the other one is that PX is small. So when, when PXJ is large, is, you're seeing a lot of Xs in uh, column J, in position J. But there aren't very many Xs overall in the sequence. That's telling you that something very unusual, or at least non-random, is happening. So it's a reasonable inference that there's some structural, chemical, biological, historical, anyway, important reason that's putting Xs in column J. That's, that's an that's telling you that that's an important piece of information. But if PXJ is large and PX is large, well, you can't really infer with the same confidence that something biological is happening, something important is happening there. Uh, it could just be that PXJ is large because PX is large. There are just lots of them floating around. So it's no big deal that there are a lot of Xs in column J because there are a lot of them anyway. And that's one extreme you want to look at. Let's look at the converse. If PXJ is small, well, again, it's beca either because PX is small. Well, either, either you have a situation that PX is small or PX is large. And again, if you have these two cases, if, if, if PXJ is small but PX is large, that's also telling you something very interesting. There's some reason that's excluding residue X from position J. And that's very different kind of information than saying, well, there aren't very many Xs in position J, and by the way, there aren't very many Xs overall. So you, you don't know whether there's a force that's excluding X from, from position J or just a random happenstance. So by taking the ratio, how many x's, what's the probability of seeing x in position j divided by the probability of seeing x overall, then um, that's, that's a way of getting at this um, idea, discrimination between this case and this case, and also discriminating between this case and that case, all right? So it's important to normalize. Uh, if you don't do that, then you really, it's, not, it's like doing an experiment without having a, a, a case control or a control. Uh, you, don't know what to, you don't know what the situation would be when you didn't have what you thought was the special variable. Okay. Now, why logs? And we talked about that a little bit last time, and I just the explanation was was one of um, just turning multiplication into addition, which is a useful thing. Actually, turning multiplication into addition is also a useful thing uh, in a computer. It's, it's actually not so much that you're turning multiplication into addition; it's that you're working in a range of numbers where there's uh, fewer round-off errors. If you have, if you're working with small numbers, small positive or small negative numbers and uh, you're multiplying those together, uh, 
you can get a lot of errors because the computer only represents a number up to a particular precision. But if you've taken the log, then you're working uh, with much smaller numbers, and at much uh, numbers in a much more reasonable range. And uh, uh, instead of working with exponential numbers, you're working with just the exponent of those numbers. That's what the log does for you. And therefore, the uh, arithmetic errors that you're going to make on the computer are uh, less. And then ultimately, you can convert back if you want to. But let's, let me explain a different idea, which is just this. When, when this, when Pxj is greater than Px, that's the case where you're saying, uh, we're going to see a higher frequency of x in position j than we would expect if, it was, if everything was just random, okay? Then what happens is that the ratio is greater than 1, okay? So log of the ratio is greater than zero, all right? So when, when x is more frequent in column j in the sequences that we're looking at, in the family that we're interested in, when it's more frequent in column j or position j than you would expect at random, then this log score is positive. On the other hand, if pxj is less than px, then this ratio is less than 1. And so the log of the ratio is less than 0. So it, it just, I mean, again, this is just sort of a nicety, a kind of a convenience. It's not an absolute mathematical necessity. But it just feels like a good thing when you have scores that you're going to use, these S's, which tell you how much, how, uh, how much weight should you put on having an x in your sequence at position j. And what you're trying to do is, is say that, um, is determine whether or not the sequence is really likely to have come from the same family. It is a nice thing. It's a nice property of your, of your s's to have positive numbers here when what you're seeing is more in agreement with the profile than with a random occurrence and have negative numbers when what you're seeing is, is less in agreement with the profile uh, than you would get uh, by random occurrence. So this is just another nicety, but it's, uh, it's kind of nice that it works out this way for the log. Now, last time we were talking about products Okay, and I want to be a little bit more um, formal about th what's, where this family of uh, sequences came from that's in the, um, that makes up the, the, the profile. So we have underneath some kind of model that generates Uh, sequences in the family. And right now, this model is very simplistic. We're just saying that every position in the sequence is independent of the other positions. So in position one, you have some probability distribution a, T, C, and G. So A is seen with some probability in that position. So P, A, 1, P, T, 1, and so on. And then you move on to position 2, and you have a different probability distribution. A, T, C, G. So the probability of A in position 2 is some number. Well, 
we've been, we've been talking about it before as PA, PXJ, but now we're being specific. And you move on to position three and so on. Okay? So this is the, this is the model of uh, what generated the members of the family. And actually, in this model, unless there's some zeros somewhere, you could have a zero. Oh, sorry, Z, two equals zero. So if there's some, if, if there are never any zeros, then in fact, every possible sequence of the appropriate length is a potential member of that family. But some of those, many of those sequences are, are members with very, very low probability if, if this model is to be believed. Some of them, some of those sequences have probability zero of being in that family, okay? So it, in this very simplistic model of what possibly generated that, um, your view is that what you saw when you sample, when you look at actual sequences, is that you're picking up those sequences that are generated from the model with high probability. Those, those are probably the sequences that were, uh, that if you, uh, I'm, I'm getting a little ahead of myself. So here's my, here's a, a bucket of sequences generated by this model. Okay? So you just imagine that you, um, you generate a sequence in the following way. In position one, you flip a coin according to this distribution, you come out with some particular residue. Then in position two, you flip another coin, four-sided coin, that <laughs> it, it falls on various sides with this probability distribution, and you generate that uh, residue, and you go on. And you do that a zillion, billion, quadrillion times. And so you fill up this bucket with different sequences each time you've generated one sequence by doing that. So some of those sequences are much more frequent than others. There are sequences that are very, very low probability. Some, if there's a zero in here, some never get generated at all. There are other sequences that are very high probability and get generated many, many times, okay? So this is the world, this is the set of sequences, the bucket of real sequences that are out there that got generated by this very simplistic model. So each one of these things is in some specific organism, an ant. I know there's a zillion billion ants out there. And you, bio, you know, Mr. Biologist comes along and samples, takes a few of these, a teeny, teeny fraction of them, and looks at them, okay? And these are the data that gets used in building the profile. And so what you're seeing, what this, what this person is seeing, generally you can expect are the ones, are the sequences that got generated with very high probabilities and is generally not going to be seeing the sequences that got generated with low probabilities. But my point is that the model here includes the possibility of generating an enormous number of, of sequences other than the ones you saw. Now if we go back to the very first lecture, I told you there's, you know, there's biological data that people know about, things they understand. And then at some point down the chain of reasoning, you come to a mathematical model, which may be uh, only a very crude reflection of what people know biologically or just see, seems so simplistic as to almost be useless. This may, may, this may have crossed that line uh, where this, this idea that this is how biological sequences get generated is so simplistic as to not be appealing. But, in fact, this is a model that, that is often used. We'll enrich this model when we talk about Markov, well, this is a Markov model. We talk about more complex Markov models later. But right now, this is a model which just says every position is independent, all right? So, that's our view of how sequences that we observe where they came from. Okay, this is somehow the, 
a reflection of biological reality. This is how we got sequences that form part of our data, part of our data set. And so now our problem, having this viewpoint, our new situation is we're given a new sequence. Okay, let's call it S1. And we want to know if we should uh, conclude that it is likely, well, we have this new uh, sequence that we, that we have in our hand. And um, we want to know how much we should believe that the sequence we're looking at was generated by this generator versus some other generator. Okay? So we have all these various generators that are out there that are generating different buckets of sequences. So we want to know um, if we should conclude that it... Now, likely comes from, likely was generated by the generator of the profile sequences. Okay? Because there are other generators out there the simplest alternative generator is the purely random one where, of course, it has the same overall structure, but what happens here is probability of A equals one quarter, <coughs> probability of T equals a quarter, probability of C equals a quarter, and probability of G <coughs> equals a quarter. And that's true for all of these. So if we have two alternative potential generators, so this generates a bucket of sequences, each with some probability. This generates a bucket of sequences, each with some probability or some frequency. And now we have a new sequence, S1, and we want to know, should I believe, should I conclude that it came from this generator or from this generator? So how would you do that? You would compute, I need a new, new board. Uh, given a new sequence, S1, we want to know if we should conclude that it was generated by the generator of the profile sequences or by some other generator. So let's call this... Um, the plus model, and this the minus model, okay? And so I would like to, uh, to decide that you compute the following thing, or you look at the probability that S1 was generated by the plus model, okay, divided by the probability that S1 is generated by the minus model. Well, what is the probability that S1 is generated by the plus model? It's just, well, S1 is a particular sequence, so you have some particular residue in the first position, which means you have some probability there. In the second position, there's a specific residue, so you have some probability there. And of course, what you do with these two probabilities is you multiply them together, because the probability of seeing a particular residue in the first position 
uh, is independent of the probability in the second position. That's part of the model. So, for example, if we say we're seeing A, A, T, then you get what's the probability of A in position 1 times the probability of A in position 2 times the probability of T in position 3. Okay? So that is... Um, The numerator is the product, the probability of S1 in position I, sorry, the probability of this character, what is in position I in, in sequence S1, and uh, this probability taken with respect to position I in the profile, I equals 1 through N. Everybody See my notation? Okay, this is product. This is the probability of, this is the same P X J that we had there, but now it's what's in position I in the new sequence, and here's position I, which refers to the profile. And so here's the probability of seeing this particular residue in position I in the profile. And you multiply those together. Okay, that's the numerator. What's the denominator? It is product I equals 1 through n, the probability of just that single character. Okay? If this is, I was denoting this by x before, and so this is just x. The probability of that character overall. All right. So if you want to um, say, ask whether the probability of uh, this S1 being generated by the plus model is, if you, want to say, if you want to determine whether it's more believable that S1 was generated by the plus model versus the minus model, you want to look at this ratio, which is this. And then... You want to take the log of this, or you can take the log of that, in order to see by what factor, by what exponent, is this bigger. I mean, generally, if to, to conclude that this came from plus, S1 came from plus, you certainly want this to be bigger than this. And you'd want it to be bigger by a lot. So by taking the log, you're saying how many uh, p powers in the exponent is this bigger than this. All right? So that's log here, but this is equal to uh, sum of the log of PS1i. That's a particular character over i PS1i, okay? And these things, it's unfortunately I erased it, it used to be over there. That's getting us back to where we started. Oh, it's right here. I just erased it. Xj over Px. Okay? This is just the summation of that score that we said we were going to be using of... Um, this particular character, S1, I, I. So actually all I've done today up so far is do more formally what we did last time in a kind of a hand-wavy way, in an informal way. So to try to motivate uh, one simple example, one simple situation where the scores that are used these kind of scores, come from the log of a ratio of what's observed to what would be expected at random. And that uh, is, a, is an idea, is an approach that, that is seen over and over and over again in the generation of scores. When we look at PAM scores, uh, PAM matrices and Blossom matrices, we'll see the same idea. Okay, I know this is a little bit abstract, um, 
take a look at those notes that I'm going to uh, put up on the web that talk about this example as well. But now I'm going to move into something that uh, comes from this in a sense. This is the most simple case of uh, what I want to talk about next, which is uh, Markov models and hidden Markov models. Now, how many people have heard of, well, you should have all have heard of HMMs, okay, because it's part of your lab for this week, if nothing else. PFAM is a whole database of HMMs, hidden Markov models. But how many people have heard of HMMs before this week? Okay. And in the context of bioinformatics? All right, a few people. All right. Uh, because HMMs actually come up all over the place and only uh, introduced into bioinformatics maybe 10 years ago, uh, but are widely used in many other uh, statistical kinds of applications. So I'm going to begin actually talking about a Markov chain or a Markov model, uh, although actually we've seen one. And here is a Markov model. Uh, and then later talk about hidden Markov models. So, and this is also um, what I'm going to be talking about now. I don't have any written notes about, but I'll try to um, uh, Xerox. You didn't hear that on the, on the camera. I'm, I'll try to Xerox a few pages from, uh, from this book. If you're interested in hidden Markov models at all, uh, this is really the book to buy. This is Biological Sequence Analysis, Probabilistic Models of Proteins and Nucleic Acids. It's, it's really mostly about hidden Markov models and their, their relatives. Um, I think I lost my place. Okay. So a Markov model really is just a, it's a kind of a drawing in the simplest form that uh, it shows you a, a certain uh, kind, allows you to talk to some extent about things that, are, that happen in sequence and have a certain kind of independence between the different uh, positions or time in that sequence. That, that independence might be each sequence, each position is totally independent of the previous one, or it may have some dependence on it in, in more complex ways that we'll get to. Okay? But the key idea is that um, you have states and you have some kind of action that happens in that state. And um, the future of what happens beyond that point is not influenced. It's, it's, it's uh, only dependent on what state you're in at the moment. So if I tell you what state you're in in the, hidden, in the Markov model, then uh, what happens in the future is independent of what happened in the past. Or, or you can, uh, it's dependent only on what state you're in. And you can see that in this little example. No matter what actually happened in the first state, we flipped this four-sided coin and we came out with some particular residue. And then we moved on to the second state and we flipped this coin and so on. When I get to the third state here, uh, what happens further down is uninfluenced by what happened past in here. Everything is, is uh, uh, actually in this case, it's independent of what happens in this state as well. But in general, in a Markov model, the dependency of the future should only be on your present state, not in any way how you got there. All right. Well, that's a little mysterious. Um, Markov models, in a sense, are like prose. You know. Everybody know what that word means, prose? Well, it's, it, there's a joke about, uh, you know, somebody uh, who learned for the first time what prose were and realized that he'd been speaking it all his life. Okay? It's a big deal. Uh, Markov models, in some way, remind me of that joke because uh, at first it seems like just a lot of word, uh, fancy words about the kind of things that you've been dealing with forever. But 
uh, it really does turn out to be a particularly nice way of laying out the logic and thinking about uh, a number of things, particularly sequences. So this um, the exposition that I'm following starts by talking about CPG islands. And so um, this really means a, a C followed by a G. And basically, these are uh, in generally rare in DNA sequences, except to possibly indicate the beginning of genes. So when you see CPG rich segments of DNA, that's a clue that a gene is, uh, is nearby. I'm being very, very simplistic about the biology, but this is about as much as I understand about, about these things. Okay. And it's sort of like, you know, one of those signs on the road that says stop ahead. You know, somewhere down the line it's going to be close. Okay. So um, it says here CPG islands are typically 100 to a few thousand base pairs long. So 100 to uh, a few thousand. Uh, and I won't pretend to tell you, understand why it is that these are generally rare, uh, but uh, not rare in, in close proximity to, uh, to genes. All right. Um, so the question, the kind of question that, that it would be of use if you're studying, you have a large sequence and you're trying to look for where a gene is possibly, uh, you want to know, are you in a, GP, a CPG island or not? Okay, just by looking at the sequences. So, really, he states it as two questions. Given a short piece of DNA, is it from a, a, a CPG island? And secondly, given a long one, a long piece of DNA, um, which segment, if any, is a CPG? Okay. So these are two reasonable questions that you would have if you're doing sequence analysis uh, looking, for, looking for genes by this kind of approach. So you, the approach that's taken is to build a, um, a Markov chain to try to represent CPG islands. So the Markov chain looks like this. It's really, uh, again, this is, you've been speaking prose all your life, right? You've been drawing little diagrams like this or similar things for a long time before anybody told you that what you were doing was fancy. And, uh, but I'll, I'll do this in its full detail. And there really is a reason. I have to, I'm, I guess I'm exposing my bias here that, when I first learned about the use of Markov chains in, in sequence analysis, I thought it was really a, a lot of hot air. Um, people just finding very fancy, obscure ways of saying very simple things. But in the end, it's proven, it's proven to be a very uh, productive viewpoint. And certainly, you'll run into it a lot in bioinformatics, particularly hidden Markov models, which we'll get to next. These are, these are plain old Markov chains, Markov models. And I'll tell you the distinction in a minute. All right, we're almost done. Okay. And I probably should have a start somewhere, but 
you just imagine that I'm just going to pick a place to start. So what, what is this? This is a generator of, um, of sequences, OK? So a sequence generator. Anyway, DNA sequence generator. And if you start somewhere, you can then pick with some probability. We have not put probabilities here yet. Where are you going to go next? Okay. So from this state, so we have four states here. It just happens in this particular Markov model that from any state, you can go immediately to any other state. That's not always true. The actual details of a particular Markov model are very important. That's what you use to model a particular set of sequences. That's part of what you use to model a particular set of sequences. But in here, we're in this, we start in some state, G, say, and then we go to some, we make a transition, which in this case could either keep us in that state, in which case we generate another uh, G. So this, the actions uh, here are actually very simple. Over here, the actions were more, potential actions were more involved. It was a probability distribution for which character got generated depending on what state you were in. But here, if you're in this state, you always generate a G. And in a sense, the probability distribution is one for a single character and zero for everything else. So you're, you're here, and then you might transition over to that state where you, see, where you generate an A, and you might transition over here to see a T, and so on. Now, if this is a sequence generator of randomly generated sequence, then you should put a probability on these edges. I, I forgot to tell you what we want to do. We want to put probabilities on these edges, transition probabilities. Okay, so we need transition probabilities. on edges or arrows. Well, if this is a generator of random sequence, so random sequence generator, then we want to have a probability of a quarter on every edge, right? If, you're, if you've just seen a T, what's the probability of your next character. Well, since the next character is generated independent of what you have generated in the past, and every character is being picked with equal probability, then these should all be a quarter. So with a probability a quarter, you go back to here and generate another T. With a probability a quarter, you go to here and generate a G. A quarter, you hear over there, you generate an A. Down here, you generate a, a quarter and so on. So we need a quarter here. So they'll all be a quarter. And remember the Markov property that I talked about earlier, which is that if I'm zooming around in here, generating characters, all right, at any moment in time, the um, future generation is independent of what I've generated so far. It can be influenced by what state I'm in. It isn't in this particular Markov model. Whatever comes next is absolutely independent of what you've just generated. But if we start playing with these probabilities, then you would get to a situation where what comes next is influenced by where you are. But it's not influenced by how you got there. The, the past has no impact on the future. Only the present has an impact on the future. Okay? Now, I'm reading a little book, by the way, on how to build a time machine, which is perfectly serious. Uh, and basically, all you need is, a, is to get a hold of a spinning black hole. But anyway, the point is there, there is no such thing as past and future and present. But we're going to ignore that uh, view, and we're, we're rather simple-minded in this 
uh, in this domain, there really is a past and a present and a future, and those distinctions are very, very important. So in a Markov chain, the present can influence the future, but the past cannot. So let me just make up some numbers where you'll understand that. Suppose I make this one-eighth, okay, and this a half, okay, and then this is a zero. So what do we, what do we need still? Uh, a quarter, does that work? No, a half we need um, uh, four eighths. We have three eighths. Three Thank eight. you. Okay. So I'm zooming around in here, generating characters, land in here, generate a T. And the point is that the future, what I generate next, is influenced by the fact that I'm in T. Well, let's just imagine everything else was still a quarter. Okay, So all the other edges are still a quarter. So the fact that I'm in here has an influence on what my next character is going to be, and it's going to be different than if I was in here. So the state I'm in at the moment does affect the probability of what the next character is going to be. The probability, if you're in T, the probability that you're, G, you're going to see a G next is higher than if you're in G is the probability of seeing a G just after a G is only a quarter, but the probability of seeing a G after a T is a half. So the present can influence the future. Yeah? Um, what if the, the future is not only influenced by the present, but also the present and the future? Like A, you, you from A and T. And, and you... Okay, so I'm making this statement that, the, that in a Markov chain, in a Markov model, uh, by the way, the, the history of zooming around here is called a chain. But this whole thing is the model. So I'm saying as a matter of definition that in a Markov model, the future is not influenced by the previous part of the chain, but it is, is influenced by where you are presently. That's a definitional statement. Now, what you're asking is, suppose you have a, a biological problem where you want the future to be influenced not just by the previous character but the last five, okay? Is that totally outside the realm of Markov models? What do you think? No, it isn't. All you need to do is have states where the state um, represents five characters at a time, okay? So it represents the last five characters that you see and then you would move on to other states with the next single character, it's going to be highly dependent. And that's Markov models are perfectly happy to have, in fact, should generally have unequal distributions, unequal probabilities. So, yes, I can incorporate the last five or the next last hundred. The number of states get bigger and bigger. If I want my next character to be influenced by the last five, then I need four to the fifth states. Okay? I need to represent five characters at a time. 